everyone, and welcome to another session of Come Rain, Come Shine. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining, uh, and thank you to the players today uh, for joining in this game. Um, why don't we just go uh, around and everybody can introduce themselves and say a little bit about uh, who they are and what they do. Okay, hey, everybody. My name is Calvin Lin. Uh, I am an artist and also an infectious disease epidemiologist. That is what I do. <laughs> um, I'm Mad Fish, and uh, I'm a writer uh, for role playing games and a player of role playing games. And we've been playing for a very long time. And uh, I got to play this game once before, and it was really fun. And I'm looking forward to doing simple chaser or lauren <laughs> i don't know um i'm a librarian and um i love role-playing games and um i've got to play test this one and i'm really excited to play it again today yeah this is gonna be fun and i'm tom and i made the game and i'm also very excited to um <laughs> to play it again a couple of bits and pieces of information before we start uh as in the previous session uh, that uh, I put up on the channel. In case for some reason you haven't seen the previous video, I'll put a link to it somewhere on the screen. It'll be somewhere uh, or in the description box below, whichever is easiest. Um, Come Rain, Come Shine is a GMless collaborative storytelling and role playing game uh, about creating a solar punk inspired community of animal folk. It is very much uh, focused on player agency, customization, and especially the narrative aspects of it. The core mechanics of this game are from the four point system. The very basics of it are that whenever a character in the game wants to perform an action, uh, and an action would just be anything that's like, uh, the consequences of which are important to the story, they can uh, spend some points from their stat pools to uh, get a, an automatic success, and the and they can decide exactly how successful that success will be. Or if they don't want to do that, they can roll uh, one six-sided die, and it's fifty-fifty whether it's uh, a success or a complete failure. And that's pretty much the the heart of it. And then everything else will kind of uh, we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see how the rest of it works as we play. So we we have our environment, our biome set, uh, which was a uh, a kind of a, a, a super kind of amalgamation of different suggestions and ideas, uh, which is exactly what you want for this kind of game. And we've ended up with uh, a kind of an ancient library um, in the middle of a tropical rainforest. So on to the actual game itself. We would start at this point with our community building. And uh, as usual, we have a series of prompts to help us as we go. So the first prompt question is, uh, what are the community's values beyond those that brought them together? So we are already all together in our community because we share the uh, solo punk values. Uh, again, like last time, I'm going to try and include some links, some helpful links on what solo punk is as a movement and as a genre in the video description. Uh, succinctly put, it's all about sustainability, uh, equality, uh, justice, and it's punk, so there's an element of counterculture there. So it's uh, a kind of hopeful rebelliousness, if you will. Uh, so yeah, so beyond those values, what kind of values would we like our community to have? Well, I mean, having a, a, an ancient library, obviously, with preservation of knowledge um, and history. Maybe. Yeah, acquisition of new knowledge, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. continually learning I think. yeah like adding new things to the library as well as preserving the old are we like tiny animals in a huge library or is it like a tiny animal sized library in a jungle 
Okay. What if it's a <laughs> tiny sized library in a giant library that we don't really like? I mean, we don't understand that it's a library because it's obviously not our language and it's who knows what right. it's okay. from. <laughs> but like, we're, we've got our own little library space in this giant space. And so, like, that's how we get like our paper, maybe. <laughs> like, oh, like just tearing up large books. books. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the characters I made is um, technically what they would call like a bookworm, because bookworms are just the insects that eat books. And so, yeah. like, maybe they eat just like the ink off of it, and so oh. it cleans the page, and that's how they get the pages ready or something. So they go, Love they'll go to like the the huge human size library or whatever, right. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. yeah. and they salvage <laughs> yes so like i i assume we would also want to utilize like the jungle element of it so maybe we like we're like on a windowsill perhaps <laughs> like okay. like a reading alcove oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah so reading like, alcove <laughs> yeah and there's like a window that opens yeah and and it's stuck open so we can like just go in and Move out in between okay so we can access both yeah I'm picturing the library world isn't exactly dry and like, like, I mean, there's going to be pockets that are dry and stuff, I'm yeah. sure, but I'm just kind of picturing a little bit mossy, overgrown, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Like yeah. My... Nature has reclaimed it, which is why mm. we are there, because we yes. are nature. <laughs> it's especially in uh, like a rainforest where everything grows so quickly, if mm -hmm. you left, you know, if you had a window open, you know, eventually like vines and stuff would make yeah. it way in. And so obviously that's going to give us a nice in and out. In that case, and I think like that that definitely like would feed into this idea that like we're like a think tank community. We're like trying to because like we obviously Ooh. know what books are, right? Because we are yeah. we yeah. we are making our own books from big yeah. books. So I guess trying to learn more about this old society while also accumulating new knowledge would be oh yeah kind of, like a fun oh, thing maybe. to do. It's like a to us. It's like a um, like we found the ruins of some ancient civilization, and mm -hmm. the rest of the library, because it's I guess human sized or humanoid sized, feels kind of like uh, just uh, an ancient city. It's it's yeah. like the, ru yeah. the ru it's like it's so mm -hmm. big, and so maybe the like regular search search parties that go off to say we need to we oh, see if yeah. we can salvage some more books. There's always more to explore. Maybe there's even other like communities in the library, you know, because it's such a big space. Like the building is so big. There's probably yeah. at least one or two, maybe other yeah. communities, and that can come up later in our yeah. yeah. You know, if we have found a way into this ancient city and built a community, it's fairly likely. Maybe it's theoretical. We just sort of assume that. There's yeah, more. maybe we've got some people in our community that are basically touting a version of the Fer Fermi's paradox. It's like, well, if there were other communities in right. the library, surely they would have <laughs> yeah. made themselves known. <laughs> so I've put down a uh, preservation and acquisition of knowledge. Do we also want to maybe put exploration as a value? Like we're, yeah. we're just a very mm. kind of outgoing people mm -hmm. seeking creativity because you know i i was looking through and i saw quite a few creatives in the character pool so i think creativity yeah. is important to counter any potential like um i guess colonial vibes maybe we should also have like the value of um like res a respectful kind of mm. exploration uh for sure just, just I, think like... more, I think it's more curiosity and just like what is this what does it do can yeah. we learn from it yeah i don't think we're i don't i, I don't see us as like destructive or like taking over i, I also feel like that. this is more of like a like a post-apocalyptic kind of vibe as well i agree that it has definitely potential for being like a post-apocalyptic or, or just like it's just been a, a very, very long time yeah. since anybody has used this this library. The next prompt is about our community's uh, traditions and customs, if they have any. Mm -hmm. um, so the the like the premise with with uh, within this game is that the community is uh, still fairly young. The idea is that we've been here for maybe about a year, 
maybe a little less, a little bit more than a year. Um, so it is absolutely feasible that we wouldn't have any uh, traditions yet, but okay. mm. I think it's still really it's a it's a it's a cool like world building exercise to do. Maybe we have a tradition of you know like a weekly or like a bi-weekly or something exploration you know where we mm. kind of just it's like a celebration like hey let's just migrate over to this section for a little bit and see what's over here you know and we spend a couple of days there so maybe it's like a monthly yeah. thing like we yeah. just as a community we just kind of shift over for a little bit and like there's some people maybe that stay at like the base camp or whatever the our mm. home base but we kind of shift to an area for a little bit explore and then come back with our new knowledge or something like <laughs> Yeah, like like a little camping trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, and, you know, I was thinking, um, because in the other game, we had like more of a temperate zone. And that led to thinking about more kind of seasonal um, festivals. But with being in a rainforest, it's almost, besides like the rainy season, you basically have the same temperature all the time. So You do kind of get seasons with like the fruit. Like when yeah. when fruit trees bear mm. their fruit, so maybe we could just have our festivals would be like little har we could have like little harvest festivals. Yeah, like, it's the mango harvest, and then yeah. it's yeah. the dragon fruit harvest. And you know, maybe we get together and and uh, the chefs try different ways of preparing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, maybe we have a little like um, a cook off, uh, a bake off. Yeah, like a yes. or something <laughs> with uh, yeah. One of the mm-hmm. characters I added to the pool is a baker, and oh, they love yeah. trying new recipes. So this is perfect. <laughs> the other thing I was thinking was also like the like discovery day. So does like the annual celebration of the day we discovered this place. Like oftentimes when like people are exploring somewhere like unknown like oftentimes like legends urban legends like pop up like folk <laughs> tales i do think like a storytelling kind of like i don't know yeah. if it's like a or something you yeah. know like, like we're, we're exploring a jungle and also a gigantic ancient library there's like bound to be stories that are going to be told and like we do like write so like i do think that would be fun as well totally like, yeah there's like regular storytelling sessions yeah like mm-hmm. Something that um, I, I immediately thought sort of based on the kind of uh, maybe to tie in the monthly expedition and the like discovery day, uh, maybe for like kids, for the younger generations, they organize a kind of um, a scavenger hunt <laughs> uh, where it's maybe not going super far into yeah. the library. Right. No. But it's like they leave little. <laughs> little artifacts for them to just, find. Yeah, just a little farther than the kids are usually allowed to go. Right. Love it. Because it's because then it's like they are learning the skills that they will then use uh, mm-hmm. when they're older, when they're doing the monthly expedition. So the uh, next prompt at this point is maybe something that we've, we've kind of, we've hinted at already uh, mm-hmm. in the previous discussion, but in general, what do we think is the community's uh, aesthetic, architecture, and I guess to some extent, the technology level? I also had this question because my one of my characters is a, a mole who's an aeronaut, and I wasn't sure if he could get an airship or a hot air balloon. I didn't know where we were at in terms of like Oh, air. yeah. <laughs> hot so. air balloon. You know, I love that sort of like um, renaissance kind of vibe. Feeling you kind know. of like Jules Verne a little bit. Yeah, I know. Like with the, okay. with the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the Da Vinci machine. Yeah. 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 Da Vinci. Okay. With like color and pattern yeah. and brightness, whereas because a lot of that stuff was very industrial. Mm-hmm. So like instead of instead of like industrial material, we're using natural materials. So oh, and a lot of um like yeah. weaving. I think like weaving of natural fibers. So we ha- we also have this kind of library, you know. Yeah. Like cozy tea vibe. But I think there's also like a, a a very cozy, relaxed 
uh, aspect to the atmosphere too. So this is made from a plant fiber, um, but like this is kind of what I'm picturing, like a lot of the weaving, like, and like you can get thinner strips and stuff. I can't find the other one, but this is kind of like the texture of a lot of the things that are handmade. Like, yeah, that kind absolutely. of thing. Absolutely, things like windmills and mm. maybe maybe we we use because um, I'm thinking, yeah, during the rain season. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be fun that we have a, a bunch of um, kind wheels. of artificial water, wheel. uh, water yeah. wheels and like uh, funnels so that we kind of channel the rainwater into Aqueduct. different parts where we need them. Aqueducts, that's the word, yeah. Not hydroelectricity necessarily, but like hydro. Yeah. Hydropower. Hydropower, yeah. Love it. Hydropower. <laughs> also, I imagine like we have a lot of water parties like maybe the inaugural like beginning of the raining season is actually like a party okay, of part. like water slides uh. and, uh, <laughs> like, i love how both of the uh communities from these recorded sessions have ended up with the inclusion of water slides i'm not kidding <laughs> <laughs> this is crucial. amazing you gotta it learn is how crucial to, to happiness if you if you look at the solar punk manifesto really carefully, you will see that one of the points is just and there will be water slides. So the next prompt after that one, what kind of accommodations uh, for the coexistence of potential like predator prey type animals uh, would be? This is um, this can be a kind of a moot question because sometimes you know you'll make a community and it might just happen that all of the animals are omnivores and so you don't really need to worry about things like that uh but it is always possible that um somebody will pick uh an animal that at least in in the real world uh is an obligate carnival the the idea behind using animals is kind of an allegory in the sense of you've got Creatures who are different species, they've got all these different uh, like appearances, anatomies, and also needs and wants, but they are still able to work together and yeah. create this kind of utopian society. What kind of, what ways, uh, if, if necessary, if required, uh, would our community have, have um, sort of come up with to get around that? The suggestion that has, that came up in the, play tests uh, mm -hmm. ages ago was we found an a fantastical food mm -hmm. that can that can meet the needs of obligate carnivores i like the dragon fruit because we you know, we did talk about that growing here so yeah it was put on earth by oh, a dragon. it's a fantastical fruit that they created Dragon's and it's now food. just growing on its own. You know, it's like yeah. they use their dragon magics. Yes. To make it. Yeah. And now it just grows okay. wild. So when you're saying uh, they created it, uh, we're thinking of like our community kind of did a bit of uh, like plant crossbreeding, or were you thinking like literal dragons? Well, my idea was like literal dragons, like yeah. <laughs> and actual magic. That's like. awesome. That's cool. That's just fun well, to me. We do have an alchemist, though, right? That's true. I did make an alchemist character. So we could just say that the alchemist made that up. <laughs> yeah, and the baker, because there's a baker, too, that likes to try oh, new yeah. things. So Combined. They could have worked yeah. together. Another accommodation, I was noticing that we have a brown bear in our community. Um, sizing. Because most oh. of the creatures that I added are, like, yeah yeah so how does it how does our brown bear fit in i was thinking it as like a animal crossing kind of situation because like there's also a snail so like <laughs> and a silverfish yeah. so and if, we really yeah. <laughs> it would be easiest if we kind of animal crossing it sorry copyright whatever it's the they're all the same size. Feature, exit. The general vibes that uh, I'm getting so far from like the, the kind of professions that we've chosen for our characters and also kind of the setting, it feels a lot more uh, kind of fantastical. So mm -hmm. I definitely would, would I, I think it would make sense for there to be a kind of um, traditional kind of high fantasy uh, size differential yeah. where you have 
Um, it's basically just short human, very tall human. So the bear yeah. would be one of the tallest all human uh, yeah. people. Yeah, just a very yeah. tall. And and the silverfish maybe reaches just up to their knee. <laughs> so we are regular sized individuals in a giant library, correct? So all of the yeah. the fruit that we produce are going to be our sized fruit, right? But I now I'm picturing we... giant fruit, and I kind of love it. What if the uh, consumption of the dragon fruit, which we could imply is somewhat magical, mm -hmm. okay. uh, has led to some of the uh, animal folk who would normally be very, very small to oh. grow bigger? Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh I my like gosh. It. Okay, dragon fruit, there are two kinds. There's a white and there's a pink kind. And it's it could be like in those, you know, you drink you eat one, you get bigger, you eat the other one, you get smaller. <laughs> okay, so Alice of Wonderlanding it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the building was not built for creatures of our various sizes. Mm -hmm. So how can we adapt to to explore it to the best of our ability? We figured out the size thing by accident, and then it just turned out to be super useful. Yeah. Is it a library exclusive fruit, or is this a dragon fruit that's Ooh. just everywhere is the same? Mm. Or, you know what I mean? Like, is this like a library exclusive no. thing? So, like, when we have visiting communities, like, right. you know, I think like... It, I think it must be a global thing because I do I, when I was reading through backgrounds like we do come from other cities so like I'm not mm. um, what if it's only in the vicinity of the library like the okay. rainforest not, not... I like the idea of it being uh, kind of local to the rainforest that we wh where this library is located mm -hmm. so it's still a pretty vast area so you, you yeah. still have like people from other communities and uh essentially by our standards other worlds like other contexts yeah. and civilization so you you definitely i think in that way you could definitely have like uh adventurers and explorers mm. from way the like completely the other side of this tropical rainforest have no idea how far it extends like and and maybe we kind of like like uh, Fish said, it's like it was initially by accident because we were looking for a way to like accommodate for different like diet needs, and then mm -hmm. we realized, wait, this can also help us in terms of like adapting to this location, and so that we can mm -hmm. kind of coexist uh, more fun more practically, I guess. So uh, again, a little a little brief um, introduction of like how the how the stat pools uh, work. Uh, fundamentally, it is the same situation as it would be for when you are uh, building a character. Uh, mm -hmm. The community and each character, uh, they have uh, four stat pools. The stats for characters are wits, stamina, dexterity, and sociability. And their analogs uh, for the community are knowledge, resilience, adaptability, and cooperation. And these are the stat pools that we would be spending our um, energy points from when we want to uh, perform a successful action. Rolling uh, for these um, stat pool amounts is exactly the same for uh, when you're rolling a character, or when we are collectively rolling for our community. Um, the reason why there are stats for the community and there are stats for each character is because in this game, uh, depending on the kind of tasks and challenges we will be met with, we might decide to collectively role play as the community as a whole, um, or we might decide to play as uh, each of us taking on a character from the character pool and playing as your, your, your kind of more traditional role-playing game sort of adventuring party situation. Um, but that is that is a, a choice that we can make when once we have uh, an idea of what kind of task uh, we will have to complete. We need to roll for our community stats. So 
as with a character, we have a total of eight uh, d6, eight uh, six-sided dice to roll. Because there are four players, what we can do is we can split it up evenly. So each of us rolls two d6, and then we'll have a, a total, which we then distribute however way we want across our four community stats. I got okay. a five and a two. I got a four and a three, so that's another seven. Uh, I got a nine total. I rolled a six and a four for ten. Okay. So we have seven and seven, 14. We have a 10, so that's 24. And then whatever 24 plus nine is. 33. 33, no. yeah. Yeah, 33. 33. 33. <laughs> so we have a... 33 total uh, amount of energy points. In the other sessions, uh, it's proven fairly useful to kind of start by thinking which stat do we want to be our strongest. Um, so out of knowledge, resilience, adaptability, and cooperation, which one do we think is uh, going to be the one with the most points in it? I'd say knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, that was you know whole thing. <laughs> yep. That's kind of, that's kind of our thing, yeah, you know. It would help if I maybe explained uh like the uh costs for success. There are like three uh options for spending energy points for three different levels of success. So they all would guarantee a successful action. Um but if we spend uh three energy points it is a total success with no side effects or consequences. If we spend two energy points, then it is a basically a mixed success. There's a success to what we're trying to do, but there's maybe a minor inconvenience to it as well. Uh, and if we spend just one energy point, we are successful, but there is a negative consequence. So such one, the thing we're trying to do is successful, but something else goes wrong. We might decide during the game to give each other advantage or disadvantage, depending on the situation within the story. We might decide that something is particularly difficult or something is particularly easy to do. Both of those mechanics literally just either increase the energy point cost or decrease it. So bearing that in mind, what, would, what do we think would be a good like uh, high number for our top stat of knowledge? out of 33. 10 or 12. Thinking, yeah, 10 or 12. I think 12. <laughs> yeah. When <We're> nerds. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Okay, so we have 21 left. After knowledge, what would be our next high stat, do you think? I was, I was gonna say, uh, like Calvin, I was gonna maybe say adaptability. Um, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Because, yeah. Same. Because it's just going by the like the definition of the stat. Resilience represents like our ability to weather like disasters and calamities, oh, okay. whereas adaptability is uh, our flexibility, our ability to change. And I think especially with the stuff about the the use of this kind of magical fruit, um, and with exploring and kind of testing areas, out, I think like adaptability would be the next one. Thinking ten. <laughs> I was vacillating between eight and ten, so let's split the difference. Nine. I would want our adaptability and cooperation to be pretty similar, and then like mm. I think resilience. I think is where we would fall short because we do live in a yeah. library, so we're not like used to like harsh environments like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think definitely because of being inside a building, like even the hardest storms. Yeah. We're just, we're barely affected by them. So, yeah. Like eight in both cooperation and, adap uh, and adaptability. Yeah. I like that. Which would leave five for uh, resilience. Yes. Just not that a lot. Okay. But... <laughs> so, we have knowledge 12, resilience five, adaptability eight, and cooperation eight. Excellent. So we have our community stats. The final thing to uh, consider when building a community for Come Rain, Come Shine are its existing structures and its goals for the future. 
this is uh, important because when we uh, accomplish tasks during game, we will earn, hopefully, if we're successful, uh, we will earn some tokens. Uh, and those tokens can be uh, spent to acquire uh, additions to the community, which can be uh, things, they can be structures, they can even be other characters that we would like to have join our community. So it helps to think about at this stage, what do we already have and what are things that we would like to work towards? We can have up to six structures at the beginning of the game, uh, excluding things like housing. Um, well, the alchemist needs his little uh, needs a little lab, but he's also very shy, so it would probably be pretty far. On, on be up edge. on the top of a bookshelf. Yeah, yeah, I know. What <laughs> and like uh, the tower. And the other character I made was uh, is the salvager, so um, she has like a little trading post. Could we possibly take that training post and kind of make like a dock area, like on the windowsill? So like, yeah. people like, so like there's vehicles can dock there and whoever happens to pass by can also exchange like, and I don't want to be like, I don't want to make like a huge bustling marketplace, but like we have a stand and then there is a boardwalk. One of uh, my characters is a tavern keeper. Um, oh, obviously. And I, and I've, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so I, I was thinking it might be fun to like have the tavern be near the trading trading post dock area. Yeah. So it's like yeah. people arriving, they have somewhere to stay, yeah, get something to eat, that kind of thing. Oh, um, I'm seeing somebody has a, a snail that's a witch. Um, do they share with the the alchemist? Like, would they would they have a similar space or? Would they kind of like hang out next to each other? So like there's an exchanging of goods at all or like. She's kind of Calvin. a herbalist. Uh, so I thought, and then we also need like a place to easily access and grow food. So mm -hmm. and I know I'm just like going off like up like a, like a pot. Uh, like, yeah, what are they called? Pot. It sits on like a window. So, oh. Yeah. Like yeah. planter. There is a place for, you know, where we can actually grow food and also any extra fantastical elements that we would want there too. I love that. We have four. So we, okay. we could have another two if we want. Okay, because I have a baker, so we probably need kitchens. Right? And if we have like a baking off, like I'm picturing that could be like maybe a future goal is that it becomes like this big thing where other communities are invited and we have a giant like bake off or cook off or something <laughs> like that. Like so maybe yeah, maybe now we have like a, a small communal kitchen. Yeah, so we've got a small um, one that works for us dreams. now. We have dreams mm -hmm. of expanding that to like a dining hall. Kind of. Yeah, so I like that idea, and I think we'd probably buy be close to the gardens, kind of. It's just that like spatially sense. is where I'm picturing it. I would like to put then, either a watermill or a windmill, just so that we have access to some some form of things so we're not just like manually grinding everything so i've added under like our goals for the future i've put a like a big dining hall so like an uh, expanding the sort of communal kitchen communal baking mm -hmm. area um would like a school or a university be too much to ask or like a library because i think that's where our goals are right is to kind of establish a knowledge base would we not need like a a preservation space like if we're you know, collecting yeah. materials and things, don't we kind of need something? We're going past, I think we already have like six structures. Because we have a, uh, like an alchemy tower. So presumably we have an area where there's like different chemicals being used. Maybe that could double as a, an area where we're kind of making sure that artifacts or books that we find are being sort of preserved mm -hmm. and kept intact. Maybe that yeah. could work. Uh, going back to uh, something you said earlier, Kevin, about the school, did you were you suggesting we have a school already, or is it something no. that you were thinking like, okay, no, like I feel like what we have now is like very much needed for a, like it's like a town to even operate. 
And I think a good goal, because we're here for like knowledge and stuff, is to like either build a school or our own library to like impart that knowledge onto other people. Not to say that uh, if we were to make a school, it would be formal, but we have a kind of informal education set up yes. at the moment where it's like we go to each other's houses and we learn yes. <laughs> skills from each other. Right. What we want is a is a building where we can go and do that. We in can actually officially. do that. Yeah. <laughs> I had a goal idea of um, some kind of a symposium or something where we invite others to come to our community to educate us on their like specialties, like where we actively invite other communities to come and share their knowledge with us and like with everybody else. And it's like a big yeah. to do. So that's like a goal, maybe to have a nerd convention. <laughs> <We're all laughs> yes. nerd yeah. It's presented as a symposium of learning and cross-cultural <laughs> sharing. <laughs> but really, it's just a massive convention. We've done quite a lot of uh, really cool uh, world building for this community. I, I really like how the sort of um, fantastical elements of our characters have kind of uh, bled through and now also the community itself uh, has that kind of fantastical element to it. I had an idea. So we do have one empty spot. Um, I only made three characters out but we have an empty mm -hmm. spot if we wanted to try and just like build one a character together. If you wanted to have yeah. like an example of an actual character build mm -hmm. and maybe for the roles this time, instead of adding all of our totals together and then dividing it, we could just take, you know, our cluster. We could each like each just get a one. stat and yeah. that's the, yeah. 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 Um, so Thimble, you had an idea for uh, a character who is like a uh, scribe, is that right? Right. Uh, we could either do a scribe or an archaeologist. It could be we because we have a like a, a record keeper. I think mm -hmm. uh, focusing more on the archaeology aspect would be yeah mm -hmm. uh, could be fun. I'm actually Character. looking at some types of primates that live in um, rainforests. There's some extremely cute little guys. Well, it's now it's a toss up between the Santorum and the Silvery Marmoset. Santorum. I saw we have a Marmoset. So, oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Then I will look for something else. No, no, no. Be before looking for something else. Okay. When I was reset, when I was looking up information about the common Marmoset, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the animal that I used for one of my characters, I discovered that uh, in Marmoset communities, Whenever there are twins born, they are usually male. Ooh, part, yes. part of the, the backstory I had in mind for this character was that they have a twin brother. I think it would be really cool to have mm -hmm. the twin brother of my character have yep. a profession like like a very like a, a very practical, serious profession, mm -hmm. like archaeologist. I think that would work really well. What we can do is, uh, all, this is the same with all of our characters, uh, we can pick two skills that are related to their profession and another two skills that are unrelated. What kind of skills would we sort of expect an archaeologist to have? Uh, I would say like excavation. Yeah. So the ability, to, the ability to remove something without damaging it, you know. And maybe also just like like finding things, like a being perceptive. They can look at something and see, like they kind of have an understanding of the lay of the land. So they can see something and be like, oh, there's probably, this seems like a pretty good spot. You know, like they can find caches of like information or. I was going to suggest then we use like an umbrella term, investigation. Yeah. What do we think for skills that are unrelated? to archaeology what does the what does your twin brother do i don't want to retread ground i i doubt that there will be a retread <laughs> i i'm i'm hope i because i don't want to spoil it <laughs> would he have picked up any skills related to his twin like because they are twins and they probably right. i'm imagining their background is that they did travel together a lot until they came here so, 
Oh, maybe he's really good at, um, I guess it's kind of related. Like I was going to say like scavenging, you know, like, or not scavenging, like foraging because he's a little more um, down to earth, I guess, maybe. Uh, maybe yeah. he's really good at foraging. I like that. I think that makes sense. What could the like the the last skill be? Fish. What do you think? Flower arranging. <laughs> Perfect. Because has a real Perfect. talent for it. Makes gorgeous like wreaths and yeah. Okay, so we have our uh, four starting skills for our archaeologists. There's really no kind of set order in which to do these various steps of character creation. Uh, would we like to do uh, the stat rolling and we each get a stat and we each roll 2d6? I rolled an 11. I also rolled an 11. I rolled a 5. I rolled 8. Okay. The uh, stats that we have are wits, stamina, dexterity, and sociability. I think wits should be the highest. Yeah, I was going to yeah. agree. Well, wits so and dexterity, we'll I think, can both get the 11. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sociability can be low. Maybe he's, uh, you know, spends more time yeah. uh, studying. He's through flowers mm -hmm. more than through, yeah. <laughs> through mm -hmm. words. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so we can maybe put the uh, the eight in stamina and the five in sociability. The next section would be their items and equipment. Uh, I, I'm wagering they have one of those uh, like rolled up uh, bags of archaeology <laughs> tools. Some scissors? Or like uh, flower yeah. like scissors? A pouch for foraging? And maybe some cloth if they find things, you know, so that they can wrap it up. We've uh, we've got their items and equipment. Traits and abilities, I guess, uh, because they are a mom set, like the character uh, I have prepared, I they would be the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to look those up. <laughs> Furry claws, climbing and jumping. When we are creating a character for Come Rain, Come Shine, because we are choosing uh, animal folk, uh, whether they are real world animals or fantastical creatures of our own design, uh, we pick traits and abilities for them. Uh, when you're making a character in Come Rain, Come Shine, you can have a maximum of three traits and a maximum of three abilities. Uh, simply put, traits are just sort of physiological characteristics that the animal has. It could be things like having wings or a tail uh, or horns or tusks or a shell, things like that. Uh, whereas abilities are things that they can naturally do, sometimes thanks to the traits that they have. So for example, a trait could be having wings and a linked ability could be flight. So that leaves us with uh, our archaeologists' personality traits. So uh, the basic rule of thumb uh, is that we think up two personality descriptors uh, that the character themselves uh, considers positive, uh, and two that the character maybe considers negative. A little snobby? Yeah. Could be something like snobby. themselves? Yeah. Or could be both. They like it, but other people don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, fine with I... being a snob. You're the one with the problem. <laughs> Not necessarily like emotionless, but the kind of like that they have a very monotone voice. As you can see, I am beside myself with excitement. That's called <laughs> flat affect. Flat affect. I was thinking uh, loyal. He definitely has been very loyal with his brother and just, you know, really feels strong loyalty, I think. Hardworking. Like, he's very yeah. into his, both his flower arrangement and his archaeology. He's very uh, passionate about those. This character, that they're in a, basically a treasure trove for an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And whenever they talk about it, they sound <laughs> just so, 
so flat, so monotone. It's like, this is the mm -hmm. greatest day of my life. Last thing that we have to think of is the character's name and pronouns. What if we call him Dan? A Dan What's would have that name? voice, is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> Hello. <Maybe. laughs> Professor Dan. <laughs> Professor Dan, yes. He, him, or they, them? They sounds appropriate. And that's basically it. That's uh, Those are the steps uh, that you would take to make a character for Come Rain, Come Shine. The time has come for our community to face its first task. Now, in Come Rain, Come Shine, we have lots of roll tables. Uh, we have uh, some roll tables for tasks. And what we can do, uh, if you like, is that uh, one of us can roll a die to determine which table we will use. And then two other players can each roll 1d6, and the total can be the, the, the task number on that table. OK, so that means we will be using table two. I rolled a five. I got a one. So we are looking at table two, uh, task number six. <laughs> a member of the ruling class of a neighboring land with which the community has poor relations <laughs> has apparently defected and asked to be allowed to join you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So um, with all of these tasks, they come with some prompt questions to help us flesh out uh, what the situation is before we play it out. Um, so the first prompt question is, who is the former ruler and what are they like? Okay. I had an idea for an for another community. With the size changing fruits, I pictured a community that really likes being big. Like, <laughs> so everybody in the community just ate the, as much of the fruit as they could to get as, as large as they possibly can. So they're just like these ginormous figures. Um, Maybe. I also had an idea that we have, there's a community that lives up in the treetops. No, that would actually make yeah. a lot of sense if the bigger people lived outside, because they've got, you know, mm. the whole forest for space. The ruler person wants to come and live on the <laughs> side, and that was like the big um, schism. Uh, are they a kind of homogenous community? Are they all the same animal? Because my mind immediately went to like, uh, an insect, like a like a very, usually like a very small bug. Yes. Yeah, oh my God. Like yeah. maybe ants, because then that would fit with the the idea of them having a ruler. Maybe it's like the queen ant, and she's decided, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> I, I'm I don't, I don't want, want to do this anymore. <laughs> I I just want a regular life. Yeah. <laughs> In the rainforest, you've got like really thick thick trunk trees, right? So right. um, they could burrow in it and have all their tunnels and everything, but like inside yeah. the tree. So where have they come from? We've, we've established that. Uh, why did they leave? Is it just that um, she was uh, tired? Or do we think there's maybe some kind of political intrigue going on? So I guess I need to ask, why do they have poor relations with our community first? And then... Yeah. Maybe they um, ate some books or something. Like something that we've, <laughs> we hadn't quite gotten to pres preserving yet. Um, and like since they're a neighboring community, they've come in and maybe they knew about the space before. And maybe that's how we found it is we saw them like coming out or something like that. And like they were literally like had a book in their mandibles and like... <laughs> Building on top of that, uh, what if they are leaf cutter ants and they just assumed that all of these loose pieces of paper and you know scrolls and pieces of parchment and books were just very strange looking leaves and so they were just taking them and using them as construction material and one of our kind of community members, yeah, like you said, they just stumbled upon them 
like ripping a book to, to pieces and just carrying bits off. And we, we kind of just assumed, oh, what are they oh, doing? Yeah. A print monocle drops, you know. Yeah, like every book. Oh, your pearls. Yeah, we call them the book eaters. Yeah, yeah, and and they they call us like the book nerds or whatever. Like (laughs) they call us nerds. Yeah, because they're like, oh, yeah, maybe they're like they're like jocks. We have like a very, you know. Yes. My God. (laughs) They literally ate so many of those fruits just to get swole. That's They're what they were true. doing. Bro, That's true. Life, bro, you know, <laughs> you guys, you don't even lift a hundred times your body weight. You guys are so small. <laughs> <laughs> but then perhaps the queen, like, have like f- taken a look at some of the pages that were torn out, got curious, and decided to come over. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, perfect. Yeah. Maybe, maybe while the queen was like, because you know they have the babies, right? So right. while she's laying there, you know, giving birth or whatever, maybe she's she's reading. She starts reading the bits of the books that made up the nest, and slowly she starts to like get ideas. With all of the uh, tasks in this game, uh, because it is a GMless game, what we do is we uh, play them out, uh, kind of like scenes. Uh, in a in a play or in a story, these scenes uh, can be played out uh, in the sort of more traditional role playing way, in the sense that we take on the role of our characters and talk as them or perform as them. Uh, it can also be third person descriptive. Um, either way is absolutely fine. Whoever feels more comfortable with what uh, it's it's all it's all absolutely okay. Uh, because the, 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 the goal is to just tell the story uh, together. The, the question that we, uh, we need to sort of answer before we sort of get into these scenes um, and later on rolling for complications as well um, is do we want this to be a community task or do we want to assign uh, a group of characters to take on this task because it might be a task that requires a smaller group depending on how we see this playing out or it might be a task where it sort of it takes everybody I kind of feel like someone trying to join the community feels like a sort of whole community thing at the same time Maybe they just ran into a couple of people, so I think it could go either way. I think yeah. that it, it could be a, a group task because I, I do think we mentioned that she might be too big to actually enter the community. So whoever is at the dock at the time is just going to be she's going to greet. I like that, and I think whilst this isn't like officially codified in the rules, um, what we could even do is alternate between each of these scenes. So if we want, we could have the uh, introductory scene, which could be like this this uh, ant queen arriving, be a group uh, situation where we have, each of us has one of our characters who just happened to be there and we kind of react to the scene. And then when we're kind of coming up with a plan, which is the next scene, uh, it could be, the community as a whole, and we could maybe, I don't know, it's like a, a, a big meeting. I like that idea, because it makes sense that the initial contact would be with the individuals, but there's a community together, we decide to, you know, how she fits in. Also, okay. I have named her Aganta in my mind, or Aganta, <laughs> oh, like Agatha, Queen... Agatha, Queen Agatha. <laughs> Queen Agatha. I like Calvin's, um, sort of prompt that it's at the dock and uh, I, I sort of I guess just like the, the the welcoming area I think maybe if we sort of each choose uh, like which of our characters we think would be there on the scene I just really want to play as this character so I'm gonna go with <laughs> Prestigio uh, <laughs> or also known as the great Prestigio uh, who is the 
twin brother of the aforementioned Professor Dan. Prestigio is a marmoset magician, uh, and magician in the sense of like a stage magician. Um, he traveled uh, with his uh, twin brother uh, quite extensively and has always been fascinated by stories and legends of magic uh, and kind of had to make do with things like sleight of hand and card tricks and things like that. I think they, they had a fairly good working relationship with their twin brother who was part of the act but I think at a certain point, uh, Dan wanted to do other things, wanted to maybe settle down, do something a bit more practical. Uh, and so now Prestigio is uh, a one a one marmoset uh, oh. act. He has a an assistant uh, who is a, a hand puppet called Sucker. It is not spelt the way you think it is. Prestigio uh, is at the uh, at the dock. I think he he might be just practicing his act in preparation for perhaps there being uh, they're expecting some people arriving soon from maybe another community or some merchants or something. And so he's just he's just sort of uh, he's got his little table and some cards and some handkerchiefs, and he's going ah yes. I shall prepare this this marvelous feat of magic, and I will astound. And no, where where did I put my wand? Oh dear! <laughs> I would think um, Errol would be there. Errol is a mole aeronaut, so I'm assuming he would just be tending his airship. Um, Errol is a former airship like transporter, so he would just go from town to town, moving people and cargo. He is very good at what he does, and wildly insecure about it. And then um, just wants to settle down um, somewhere. So I think that's why he's here. But I think in this particular scenario, he would probably just be like tuning up his airship when a giant ant queen. <laughs> I think Turin would be there as well. Um, and Turin is a very unusual little critter. She is a part squirrel, part lizard basically um so if you sort of imagine a squirrel down her back on the tops of her arms and legs on the top of her tail and on her belly she has scales and then the rest is fur she because she is like that she is sort of um amphibious so she can actually spend some time underwater uh, as well as climb trees so she kind of goes everywhere that's why she has that the little um, salvage area because she can get into so many places and she does she's got her little trading post uh, that she has on the windowsill she would definitely be up there um, I was thinking just looking through our character pool that uh, Heeper the spotted winged fruit bat courier would definitely be hanging out on the windowsill, probably poking around, you know, maybe playing around a little bit with Prestigio and his magic tricks, but also just kind of waiting to see if there's any deliveries that need to be made. Um, so they're just kind of hanging out um, on the sill, just sort of like kicking around and probably trying to yeah. help like Chiron with the with their shop a little bit, maybe getting a little bit underfoot. Um, but... <laughs> Ch Churan, uh, I don't suppose you have any, um, I don't know, any extra twigs or, or sticks. Uh, I seem to have misplaced um, my, my wand, you see. I know it, it has fabulous arcane powers and it's technically irreplaceable, but for the, for the time being, I, I, would, I could settle for a substitute. I don't suppose you have anything about yay, yay long. That sort of thing. So I imagine that um, overhearing this heaper is just kind of like looking around and looking kind of over the ledge and he sees this little stick just this kind of just wiggling a little bit and he's like oh and goes over to like pick it up and suddenly there's a giant ant face <laughs> and the <actual laughs> of an ant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you know heaper just kind of screeches like Oof! you know kind of gives like an echolocation like 
oh my gosh, there's something in my face and kind of like jumps back and falls to the ground a little bit. Very surprised <laughs> that that was not a stick. <laughs> they were not paying attention. <laughs> I've also, I'm imagining, like, if, if this ant is just so massive compared to us, like, when she kind of puts her her front legs on the dog, does that, like, make the airship kind of, <laughs> like, what's Errol, what, how does Errol react? Errol, this is, this is his baby, so I'm pretty sure Errol is just, like, muttering every single curse word under the sun, trying to stabilize his airship. Um, and he's he's already gonna he's already getting pretty angry. I think he's gonna try to he's he, if he sees something big coming over his way, he's he feels the need to be the biggest person. So which is he's a short mole, so this is perfect. <laughs> but he'll <laughs> pop his chest out, like okay, like who's 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 screwing around my ship? This is not his precious. Car. And then he'll just look over and see like, a giant ant, and then he'll just stop talking <laughs> for a ah. second. He's like, ah. Um, now what we could do at this point, uh, because we have this kind of inciting incident that's quite an incident uh <laughs> and in the sense that it could cause incident uh we can roll for a complication now what this does effectively is this introduces like a, a, a level of difficulty to the situation but if we can overcome it if we can find a narrative way or spend points or roll die to kind of overcome it then we will get an extra token if at the end of of the task so we'll be using uh, the first table. Three and a five. Eight. Interference from an outside power. <laughs> the other ants don't want her to leave. She's being chased? Yes. Oh my this gosh, could destroy so scary. This could end of our this community. First maybe, could destroy it. Yeah. maybe uh, uh, the ants were about to have um, a sports game. And uh, the queen was supposed to be on their team. And so, like, they're starting the game and she's not there. And now they're like, where? Where is she? Where's our team? We got, we got a game. Okay. Oh, oh we got a game. So they're not, so, like, chasing her down. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like, Aganta is kind of, she's come up to the side of the, of the trading post. Everything's rocking. Everything's kind of <laughs> a little bit precarious. And she kind of sees maybe Heepa first because Heepa was right there and, mm -hmm. and kind of says, please, I, I need you to hide me. There are several members of my um, court, I suppose you could call them. They're, they're, they're currently, uh, look, they're searching for me and I would really like to be, um, uh, be able to abscond. So uh, if any of you little, uh, little friends would be willing to hide me in any way, uh, and, and, say, and we can hear like, Bro, where you go? <laughs> my queen, <laughs> my <Jesus>. British. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. She'll start. Uh, Churn will start digging through her uh, her to salvage to see if she has anything large enough that would uh, cover the uh, or, or she can put together. Pre Prestigio uh, sees uh, Churn doing this and is like, I think you're on to something. Uh, but I think we'll we'll be needing a lot more fabric, <laughs> and and he just starts pulling out like <laughs> not an egg sheet, and it's an absurd <laughs> amount. Like it keeps going like for a full five minutes. He's just got loads and loads of it. <laughs> I, I do want to say while you're doing that, I want Errol to be like you know like to keep her just like you know I always hate his tricks, but this one this one always does it for me. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know where that fabric comes from, but it is, I, I will give him that. <laughs> It comes from a pocket dimension. <laughs> um, Heeper is used to the idea of like going back and forth between people, like, and so I think Heeper's like, uh, uh, this ant is too big. We can't hide him. So, like, I think Heeper would probably think about. Um, so I'm just checking personality. Yeah. So very cheerful, friendly, very friendly. Oh yeah, sure. We can absolutely hide you, Aganta. Uh, you're a little too big though. Uh, let's go get the you. Know, and I think he'd like think about going in to visit with oh um is it Shella, who's oh. like our snail witch, and maybe they kind of work with a lot of the um the fruit, the dragon fruit, and so he's like, wait here, I'm I'm gonna go get Shella, and uh, if if we make you smaller, we can hide you because I mean you don't fit right now, but 
we can we can fix that we can fix that and then i think keeper just like takes off without like actually checking to see if again does okay with it i think he just goes for it <laughs> we're, we're tossing like i'm helping toss these like handkerchiefs because you're pulling them out and so i'm like like make enlarging them like unfolding them into like a bigger <laughs> thing so we can like so we're just covering this ant queen in like patches of fabric what we can do like mechanic wise here is like we're each kind of doing something i was going to propose something to uh to errol um so what we could do is thimble you can if you if you want to spend points for just uh, an automatic success in terms of getting the fruit uh like the shrinking fruit back to the queen in time then you could spend some points or you can roll a die uh likewise with uh churin if you want to like spend points to be able to kind of makeshift a big enough kind of tarp <laughs> for, to, to, <laughs> to put over the this and uh i was going to suggest to errol errol i am in dire need of your aeronautical vehicle can you <laughs> can you set me aloft <laughs> I need to be a lot. I will see. I, I will say, Errol has like a, you can see in his eyes, like a brief sense of fear because he has an idea but doesn't want to say it. Because <laughs> if he deflates his balloon, I think that would be a big enough tarp to hide the hand. Prestigio just grabs Errol by the shoulders. <laughs> Errol, I would never ask that of you. I can see it in your eyes. Your tiny mole beady eyes. I can see it. I, I would never ask that of you. Unnecessary. No, you see, <laughs> I, I have developed a unique uh, spell. Yes, it's definitely a spell. That allows me to throw my voice, if you will. And I, I, I suspect that we could perhaps trick these uh, ants that their, their queen is elsewhere uh, if we took to the air. And I could throw my voice and, and convince them, perhaps, that the, the queen had gone in a different direction. And in the meantime, our companions can uh, cover the queen and help her shriek. What do you think? Would you be able to take us along? While Presidio is talking, Errol is already like pushing Presidio onto the airship <laughs> as you're explaining the plan. Um, Errol's just like, yeah, I, I do, as the, as the deck is like, <laughs> like rocking, <laughs> Errol knows that the safest place is going to be in the air and not on this dock. He's just gonna like, okay, let's just, yeah, you got a yeah. plan, let's go. <laughs> I'm gonna be spending points to do ventriloquism, to do this throwing of my voice. Uh, what do Thimble and Fit, do you want to spend points to? Do you just want to be successful? Or do you want to introduce chaos? I think I'm gonna spend points for Heeper. Can you remind me how that works again? Depending on the type of action that you're doing, you said you were going to be uh, sort of, I guess, flying as fast as you can to the garden to get the shrinking fruit and then coming back. I'm guessing that would be a dexterity action. Um, so yeah. you would spend uh, three points uh, from that. If you think you are using uh, one of your skills, then that would give you advantage and so that would reduce the cost. Okay, so I have a finding shortcut skill and a navigating skill. Yeah. That's perfect. So you would spend uh, two points instead two points. of three. Okay. I am uh, I am a, a creature of chaos. <laughs> I think uh, so. We we have to do some rolls for this. Yeah. One. So what you uh, so what you're going to do? So you would roll one d six, and if it's a one, two, or a three, it's a failure with a negative consequence. If it's a four, five, or a six, then it's a success. That's a three. <laughs> okay. The fabric, the, it's from, you know, Prestigio's magic trick. So it's very silk and like just beautiful, yeah. super bright colors, very uh, vibrant. And I picture that like a gust of wind has come along and picked it up. <laughs> and now it's waving like a flag, like this multicolored like string of fabric <laughs> flag that's just like waving in the air and like, hello, this is, look at this brightly colored <laughs> thing flapping in the wind. And, it's very much now like a here I am sign instead of a hiding disguise or something. I am definitely spending points. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be spending uh, two points because uh, I'm using a skill. I'm using ventriloquism. 
um, to do my voice throwing. Uh, is Errol gonna? How's Errol going to sort of? Because this would be flying, I guess. It would be yeah. sort of maneuvering us so that we're within earshot. Uh, do you want to spend points too? I would spend two points. Okay. Because you have advantage in piloting, yeah. I'm guessing. Okay. Hello! It is <laughs> I, your queen! I'm over here! Come this way! <laughs> Don't look at that thing! In the meantime, maybe the, the queen has been given the, the shrinking fruit. <laughs> ah, Errol, that was an excellent flying! <laughs> Errol's just like... He's like, truly the past three minutes have been the most stressful. <laughs> Everything just happened so quickly for Errol. Errol's just like, I, I came here to retire. <laughs> <laughs> what is even going on right now? Yeah. yeah. This, so this first scene, we've had our complication. We have overcome it. Uh, so we already, we already know that we have uh, a token. Regardless of whether overall this task is successfully completed, we still get a token for every complication that we overcome. The next uh, scene then could be uh, us playing as the community as a whole. What do we think our community with its values and resources, how would we approach the situation? I think we'd have uh, like a discussion over dinner. <laughs> Especially when you're talking to someone you, you don't get along with. There's like a sort of, you know, breaking bread together, as, as they say, is like a bonding kind of thing. If as a community we've kind of organized uh, basically just a dinner um, to give a Ganta kind of a feel for what life is like uh, with us, would we be spending energy? Like, is this something that we think we would be really wanting to succeed in? I was thinking that as part of the dinner, um, discussion would definitely be had of what does Aganta bring to the community? You know, what what mm -hmm. can she teach us? What knowledge does she bring? Um, and is that something that we want in our community? I think would be a discussion that we would have. Because <laughs> all we know of her for now is that they were swole and that they <laughs> ate our books. You know, yeah, and so that's I think true, there, that's fair. the dinner would go successfully in that we're all eating together, but I'm not sure that <laughs> well, we'd be like totally convinced that she has something that she could bring to our society. So I think, I do think our society might be a little snobby at this point. Is that, yeah. is that part of our community? Like, are we looking only for people who can help us build or do we mind having people along who maybe don't have something or does she have secret knowledge that we don't know? I think it would just be more of a, and even in just a, a, a more like in a, a more sort of practical way, like or innocent way, you know, what what are you bringing to? Uh, what can we learn from you? And keeping in mind, because we are a solar punk community, we don't have hierarchies at all. So we're also going to be looking at her skeptically in the sense of so uh, it was. Uh, it was just you telling everybody else what to do. <laughs> huh. Interesting. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. That um, yeah. Would you be wanting to do that here? <laughs> because... Yeah, that would be a concern for sure. Maybe we'd invite her to help wash the dishes after. Or perhaps fix yeah. the dock, because I do think she might have damaged it a little bit. Never had anybody that um, had so. Yeah. yeah, you know, we're gonna need to adapt it. We're gonna, you know, it's gonna need some bolstering. So, so we've we've spent points to kind of make sure that the dinner has has gone really well. I'm gonna propose that we roll for a complication. Yeah. Uh, especially considering that we we're asking something of her. You know, she's probably explained why. Like she said, you know, I. I am I am maybe thinking that she's not British and she should have maybe like a valley girl. So like I so I was like reading those books. Oh my god. Words. And like how they work. And like what happens when you like put them together. Yeah. You put words yeah. together. And like stuff happens. And like it makes sense, you know? Professor Dan is just Yeah, like, I was about to say. 
<laughs> would would kill to hear their conversation. <laughs> yeah, words are fascinating, I guess. <laughs> Syntax is just a world of wonders. <laughs> okay, I rolled a five for the table. Okay. And then three so, total for the complication. Something important breaks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so does she break the the windowsill? Does she break no, the break stall it. for the scavenging? Or does she break, she break airship? <laughs> airship? <laughs> Maybe she knocks the um, part of the dock off the windowsill. Yeah. Not the whole thing, just part of it. Not the whole thing, but like the bit where she put her, yeah. her front leg, the bit that she leaned on, mm -hmm. it, it had already been weakened at that point, and she's there maybe sort of trying to figure out how a hammer works. <laughs> but just, <laughs> just collapses. I would love a Rube Goldberg-esque kind of... <laughs> but I think on her part, it's not, like, malicious. It was just... No. She just doesn't know yeah. how these things work. And <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my god. Oh my god. I could, I could picture her, like, fully, like, crying over this. Because <laughs> I, I think she... I, I mean, I, I feel like she's had a very stressful time. Yeah. <laughs> She's in a different. She's in a new place. She's surrounded by new people, and she's trying earnestly to make things right. But maybe oh. she's just an absolute klutz. Yeah, <laughs> she's just really clumsy, and this just happened. And she's like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> the little mole guy is gonna hate me." <laughs> um, Annie, the mongoose carpenter. One of their traits is that they're slow to action, so they they take a minute to like actually get started. And so I think that they knew that like there was going to be some construction up there, and you know fixing the docks and things. And so I think they slowly were like, "Okay, I'm just gonna finish my nap. I gotta I gotta sleep off dinner, and then I'll go take a look at it, and you know see what we can do." So I think finally they've made their way up. Um, <laughs> And at this point, they hear the tears, and like you know, they're they're easygoing and affable, so like they'll probably come in and be like, "Oh, let me see, what what can we do? You're okay. Don't <laughs> don't worry about it. We we got this. Okay, this they're, is not a big deal." Standing there with a cup of coffee, and like, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> um, um, and I think also um, Ardalian. Who is the alchemist? Um, he's very, very shy, but uh, you know, uh, from the high bookshelf uh, space that he, he can see all of this happening, <laughs> and um, and he comes down with um, a, a cup of of tea, um, and just sort of shyly walks up to the queen and and then holds this little cup. This very wonderful smelling. Tea. She's just full. She's bawling at this point. She's like, oh my god! Thank you so much. And it's a it's a calming tea. It has like a soothing effect. Um, okay, so how this could play out, like mechanically, uh, every time that we we have a, a complication. Um, technically, and I realize we didn't exactly do this for the last one, but technically speaking, uh, it would make the difficulty of all of our actions uh, go up a level. So mm -hmm. it effectively, it would increase the, the cost of things. Um, however, I think the sort of the fact that we have a like a skilled carpenter as a part of the community, and we've had this kind of a uh, gesture of uh, solidarity from both the carpenter and the alchemist, especially the alchemist is really uh, shy and the fact that they ventured out to provide some, some, some support, I think would probably balance it out a bit because this, this whole section has mostly been community. We could uh, maybe spend from resilience uh, if we wanted to, we could spend like uh, a full three, three points um, 
we're, we're spending from our community stat of resilience. Yes. And so this is another complication that we have overcome. At this point, uh, it would get to the, like the resolution. Um, do mm -hmm. we think that a Ganta would sort of successfully um, integrate uh, within our community? Yeah, I would say it probably wouldn't be unanimous, but it is like, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it, maybe even the dissenters would be like, well, well, we'll just, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. Let her stay, but see what happens, you know? I think that yeah. uh, Shella and Sylvie would show Aganta the specific things that are okay for her to chomp on. Yeah. And <laughs> say, this is, this is chompable. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. And and the scavenger would most certainly, uh, Turin would most certainly appreciate having someone who could lift huge things. Yeah, I think it might be a little little bit of a rough start, but uh, I think she would eventually kind of find her, her way. And maybe that would help us uh, get along with the other ants better because she can... Um, kind of explain their ways to us a little better. What this means then is that we are considering this task a success. So all that means is that we get a token for the task, which mm -hmm. on top of the complication uh, tokens means we have a total of three, which means we have enough if we want to uh, get one of those additions to the community that we were we were thinking of. However, based on what uh, we you were you were saying, Fish, as well about maybe the fact that she can tell us about her community, it might be interesting if she was the addition to the community, both mm -hmm. narratively but also mechanically, and maybe she could be like a diplomat, um, or we could have a larger dinner hall. It could also be that the fact that she is, uh, you know, she is learning maybe how to use her abilities uh, more sort of for, for collective goals. Maybe she helps out with the construction because it may be the diplomat thing is something that she needs to sort of build up her confidence for. Yeah, I, I think it, practically it would make more sense like immediately that she would just um, help us build. And... So that means that we, uh, we can spend our three, three tokens, and we are now equipped with a really big <laughs> dining hall. So fantastic. So it's been a successful first, uh, I guess, trial for our community. We have uh, overcome all the complications. We've added uh, a person to our, a new person to our community who's curious about our ways as much as we are, I guess, curious about, about hers. And yeah, that was really, really cool. I really enjoyed that. Thank you all so much for, for joining in this game. Uh, yeah. You've all been absolutely wonderful. The characters, the, like the, the world building uh, we did together was, was wonderful. And yeah. I thank you also for everyone who's watching. And, and uh, if you, you have uh, downloaded or purchased the game, I hope these uh, sessions have helped in sort of getting an idea of how, how to play the game, how it works. And, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, I guess bye-bye. Yeah. Until next time. <laughs>